All right, welcome everyone to uh, what has seemed to have really quickly become our final session of the day. Went by pretty quickly. Uh, thank you for joining us for our panel on the functions of comics. Uh, my name is Keith Friedlander and I will be the chair for this panel. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, we have three excellent present presenters with us today for this panel and I'm going to be introducing them one at a time with their talks. Before we get started introducing our presenters, uh, I will begin with a short land acknowledgement statement. While this year we are coming together from all across Canada and the world, uh, we still want to acknowledge that our organization operates from both treaty lands and the unceded territories of the indigenous peoples of multiple and distinct nations across Turtle Island. I myself am speaking to you from Treaty 7 territory. Treaty 7 is the traditional home of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Satina, the Stony Nakoda, and Métis Nation Region 3. Um, so yes, the, the topic of today's panel is the functions of comics. And our first speaker will be uh, Maxwell Dixon. Max is a PhD candidate in the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta. His dissertation explores collaborative narrative and tabletop role-playing games, and his other research interests include contemporary speculative fiction and questions of accessibility in comics. And today he is presenting a paper, text as a way of seeing the persistence of the visual in the transcription and interpretation of comics for the blind. All right, thanks, Max. Thanks so much, and thanks everyone for, for coming today. And I'm speaking to you from the um, from from Edma, from the city that many of us know as Edmonton or uh, Miss Quachiwa Skygon um, in Treaty Six territory in Métis Region Four. I'm here to talk to you about comics today, having never read a comic in its original form because I can't see. When I needed to read comics during my PhD coursework, I did so via panel transcriptions produced by the Accessibility Resources team at the University of Alberta. This occasionally produced situations in which I referred to an image a transcriber had interpreted differently than had the rest of my class. These moments intrigued me. So I decided to read multiple transcriptions of a single comic sequence in order to investigate how a transcriber's visual experience with a comic might affect both what they articulated about the comic in writing and what interpretations this could then prompt in me as a blind reader. What I've learned is that the discrepancies between multiple transcriptions of the same page confirm that comics require an awareness of the visual, even if you can't see. My interaction with comics is defined by text but it is the visual that shapes the conditions of possibility for these textual interactions. This extra deliberative step in the process of decoding that reading comics blind necessitates highlights the degree to which comics attempts to shape their readers understanding are in constant conversation with the ways individual readers responses to the image on a page mediate meaning. Let's examine the ways two comic scholars think reading and meaning making work in this medium to establish the assumptions my experience of comics adapted for the blind complicates. Scott McLeod identifies the visual sequence as the most important component of meaning making in comics. His perspective assumes that individual images are pretty easy to interpret, characterizing pictures as received information and writing as perceived information. He does, however, Imagine a very active reader, emphasizing the hard work the reader does to create meaning out of fragmented sequence, which he calls closure, and describes as, quote, observing the parts, but perceiving the whole. Meanwhile, Charles Hatfield positions text's importance to graphic narrative as equal to that of images, pointing out that, quote, pictures are not simply to be received, in McLeod's terms, but must be decoded, end quote often with the help of textual elements, and insisting that the interplay between these types of signification is one of the crucial tensions that constitute comics. In articulating this tension, however, Hatfield creates another distinction, one between symbols that show 
that exist for the purpose of depiction, usually representational drawings, and symbols that tell, that, ex that explicate the images. My interaction with transcribed comics doesn't neatly match or contradict either of these perspectives. My experience positions the visual sequence as the primary unit of meaning in comics, with the textual occupying an important but supporting role, emphatically not because images are transparent in their meaning, but because of an additional tension that Hatfield's discussion of symbols that show and tell does not consider, specifically the tension between what a viewer sees in an image and the ways this seeing medi mediates what they can say about that image. Text is crucial to my understanding of the comic being described, but this text has been determined by the transcriber's visual experiences, as they must engage with the image before setting the terms on which I can engage with it in turn. We often think of text as a container for meaning. Here, the visual experience is the container, and the resultant text is shaped by and must fit within that container. So, what did I actually do for this project? I selected a spread from a transcribed comic and then asked two colleagues to produce additional descriptions of these pages beyond the one I had, I had received from the accessibility services folks uh, to the U of A, writing in whatever way they felt best. I chose pages 36 and 37 of Sarah Leavitt's memoir, Tangles, which depict the narrator and her parents attending the medical appointment that sets them on the road to her mother's diagnosis with Alzheimer's. And I'm going to share that now. Okay, I hope that's visible because I'm a Zoom ignorant and if it's not visible, I got nothing. Throughout my discussion of these documents, uh, of, the, of the transcript documents, I'll refer to them as transcripts one, two, and three. Transcript, transcript one was written by Amanda Daigneau and transcript two by Gregory Blomquist, both my colleagues in the English PhD program at the U of A, while transcript three was written by Jean Jackson and the accessibility resources team. These transcripts pay differing attention to details or address the same details using different words in ways that alter my impression of the scene. From the doctor's initial question, uh, questions at the top of page 36 to the tentative diagnosis he delivers in the family's exit at the bottom of page 37, each transcript for the blind conveys the same narrative broadly, but on smaller visual, po visual points, they build on or depart from one another. For instance, the, tree, the three transcriptions describe the doctor slightly differently, particularly as he appears in panels one and two on 36. Transcript one evokes him this way, quote, he has short hair combed messily to one side. He has a dark unibrow and a beard and is wearing a collared shirt and gray tie and has a pen in his breast pocket. In transcript two, the doctor is quote, a scraggly haired and bearded man while in transcript three, he has a slightly receding hairline as opposed to messy hair. His unibrow is gone and he instead has bushy eyebrows. His beard is specifically a pointed beard and he has grown a small mustache. Transcribers occasionally read characters' facial expressions in contradictory ways. In the sixth and seventh panels on 37, Transcript one describes Sarah's, the, cur the, uh, the curly haired woman, the daughter, Sarah's expression as first angry and then sad, while her father, the older man, is concerned or anxious. Whereas in transcript two, both are looking nervously at one another with no shift marked in Sarah's expression. Are these differences between transcripts pedantic? Absolutely, I'm an English major. However, such differences in how viewers express their interpretations of comics illustrate that pictures are not, as writer and artist Will Eisner would have it, quote unquote, universally recognizable in their specifics. Multiple people can look at the same image and at least as mediated through the ways they describe and prioritize that image textually, see different stuff. 
These differences in what transcribers see and, are, and or prioritize grow more complex when the transcriptions deviate from their generally detached tone to interpret a panel. As these moves help craft, in McLeod's terms, the closure I as the reader am able to find in the sequence. In discussing their recent work on writing textual comic book description, Rachel Oselin and Leah Brochu point out that it is long established practice to present descriptions of other mediums such as film for the visually impaired as objective catalogs of features and events that avoid judgment or interpretation. However, they also note that one of their primary goals and one of the priorities of the blind readers they consulted is to craft a description which allows the reader to have an experience matching the transcribers as closely as possible. And I think what my experience with these transcripts suggests is that quote unquote objectivity might not be the path to this closeness of experience. Disability scholar Georgina Kleege has a pretty negative perspective on these performances of objectivity, arguing that quote, the insistence on objective neutrality seems to come from an assessment that sighted viewers enjoy an autonomous, unmediated experience of visual media, which is more or less the same from viewer to viewer. Therefore, if the, if the describer simply chooses the correct words, an image will be transmitted directly to the blind person's mind's eye, where she can form an independent aesthetic judgment about it. She recommends avoiding studied neutrality in descriptions for the blind as it elides the presence of the describer and whatever impact the work has had on them. These transcripts illustrate the value of this perspective because in occasionally departing from the descriptive to offer brief interpretations that each shape and load the sequence somewhat differently, they show that sighted viewers articulate visual content in a manner almost as mediated as that in which blind readers experience it. The big example of this on these pages is the varying degrees of unpleasantness the transcripts read in the doctor's questioning of Sarah's mother, Midge, and the ways this difference inflects each transcript's presentation of the last panel on 37, in which, having been bombarded with questions and technically diagnosed with dementia, Midge exclaims, oh, that doctor was just so nice. Transcript three, generally the least interpretive, depicts Midge's encounter with the doctor as tense, but doesn't elaborate, describing him as quote unquote, peppering her with questions um, to which she responds by quote unquote, looking stunned. Transcript one attends to leave its use of space here, describing Midge at the, the, on, on page 36 near the top as quote, centered and isolated at the bottom of the panel, while around her are arrayed several questions in bold all caps text at various angles suggesting the questions are being tossed at her or hang in the air." End quote. In emphasizing that Midge is separated from other characters and encircled by questions, this description creates, at least for me, a more marked sense of discomfort during the questioning and a sharper contrast between this discomfort and Midge's final statement on the last panel, in the last panel on 37. Transcript two, meanwhile, encourages a form of closure that reads this sequence as not only sad, but also oppressive. Here, quote, the thick, bold text swirls around Midge, conveying the doctor's questions, giving these outwardly simple questions, such as, where do you live? An authoritarian or intimidating edge. Transcript one, pro end quote. Transcript one prompts me to read the questions as difficult and upsetting. In transcript two, they are overbearing and slightly cruel. Transcript two's interpretation of visual cues urges me in turn to read the doctor as unkind rather than detached, an impression reinforced by that same transcript's omission of the doctor's expression when he delivers his diagnosis near the bottom of pay of 37, whereas in transcript one, he has, quote, concerned eyebrows and a downturned mouth, end quote. This reading increases the contrast between the medical appointment and Midge's final exclamation even more. And indeed, transcript two is the only one that glosses Midge's statement, pointing out that it shows her to be, quote, seemingly oblivious to the events that have just transpired, end quote. A decision that positions this contrast as especially important to closure in the sequence. 
The varying meanings these three descriptions make highlight the degree to which the representational elements Hatfield calls symbols that show are themselves also potentially explications or symbols that tell or have explications vested, vested in them. Each visual experience shapes a textual evocation through investing in different degrees of distress and contra. Or, um, let's start that sentence over as I seem to have turned it around. Each visual experience shapes a textual evocation that, through investing in different degrees of distress and contrast, suggests different forms of closure to the blind reader. My experience here highlights the visual's potential to shape our interpretations and what we say about them in a culture that, while it is as cliche notes visually oriented, often assumes the preeminence of text as a vehicle for ideas. The differences in reader experience made visible by comics transcripts give us an opportunity to see text as reactive. John Berger writes that, quote, seeing comes before words, elaborating that it is seeing which establishes our place in the surrounding world. We explain that world with words, but words can never undo the fact that we are surrounded by it." End quote. Berger then says a bunch of stuff about how seeing uh, about how seeing constitutes our position in the world and our capacity to relate to others that as a blind person I'm basically obligated to disagree with. But his configuration of the visual as what surrounds us and textual articulations as inevitably existing within that billowing visuality provides a useful way to think about what we learn from the process of adapting comics for the blind. He goes on to point out that looking is never neutral, stating that, quote, the way we see things is affected by what we know or what we believe, and that to look is an act of choice. End quote. How a viewer sees an image shown to them based on their priorities and concerns, as well as the affordances of the image, mediates what they can tell about it and the kind of sense it can be used to make. The articulation of what is seen that's essential to transcription slows this process of mediation down enough to render it visible to us in a way it normally is not. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Max. That was excellent. All right. Okay, so our next speaker is Aaron Weiss. Aaron has been in the media industry since the age of, excuse me, turn my camera back on. Uh, Aaron has been in the media industry since the age of 13. His 2009 documentary, Our School, on Canada's first publicly funded Afrocentric school has been sold at libraries across Canada and presented at academic conferences. He's been actively involved in community engagement, bringing arts-based programming and sports activities to schools and NGOs in underserved communities. Aaron completed a Bachelor of Arts in Radio and Television from Ryerson University in 2001, an MA in Cinema and Media Studies at York University in 2014, and is currently completing his PhD in Humanities at York University where his research focuses on sequential art as wartime propaganda. Other areas of research are art therapy, epigenetic, inheritance and trauma, and comics as pedagogical tool for learning and social justice discourse. In terms of work in trauma, his chapter, Art, Trauma and History, Survivor Story, was published in The Future of Humanity, Revisioning the Human in the Post-Human Age, Aaron also designed a course on trauma for a private college, SOCI 3018, Advanced Studies in Trauma from Origins to Interventions. And today, Aaron is going to be presenting a paper, Comics as a Pedagogical Tool in Education for Children, a Case Study in Toronto. Take it away, Aaron. Thank you. First of all, let me apologize for sending you an extended bio. That was clear at the end here, but thank you for covering um, all the terrain. Just give me uh, one moment, please. Uh, okay, now we should begin. Good old technical issues. 
share screen. Um, sorry, everybody, just give me one second here. I actually teach online, so I'm generally accustomed to this, but for some reason, it's Murphy's Law. Um, I have it open. Sorry, guys. Is it giving you any messages or is it just? No, it's clearly me. Um, oh, okay. Sounds... There we go, right? Excellent. All right. Thank you to the universe and anyone who exists up there. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for your patience with my struggle with technology, but hey. Um, today, I'm happy to present student engagement through diverse representations. Comics as pedagogy, the theme is arts for inclusivity, equity, and justice. The comic book that I created is Gary's Global Heroes Battles Bullying. It promotes student engagement and learning retention. Comics is a method approach for teaching about bullying and hate. I just want to dive into that for a moment. Why I thought it was an appropriate um, tool is it attracts youthful readers that are usually malleable in terms of their demographic and open to superhero stories. Superheroes are a shared experience as they belong to the popular. Superheroes are a point of identification. We clearly saw that with Black Panther and Wonder Woman among other examples. And importantly, a symbol of hope. Superheroes are aspirational and they're, I think, provide or represent a good entry point um, to engage with children and teenagers about sensitive and important issues. Just a little bit of history um, in terms of the comic book project. We started in 2016. We work quite closely with Alexandria Park Community Center in downtown Toronto. So we piloted it through a workshop. In 2007, we redesigned and enhanced it. We rolled it out in 2018. And in 2019, we became a program partner with TDSB and we were actually just renewed thankfully for another three years because it is a privilege anytime you have an opportunity to interact with children. Target groups is kids between grades two and eight. This is very important. It was co-created in consultation with experts and stakeholders in the field. Dr. David Reese, a psychiatrist, Sabita Ramlal, a PhD candidate in education and public policy consultant and Donna Harrell, among many accomplishments. She's the founder of Canada's first publicly funded Afrocentric school. A the theoretical framework, this might sound a little bit odd, but I actually employed labeling theory. Even though historically it has a negative connotation, um, I wanted to approach it from a different perspective. So just to provide some background here, Alter's article for Psychology Today argued that labeling a person, for example, as quote, smart, end quote, makes it so. Pointing to research conducted by Rosenthal and Jacobson, which illustrated that teachers would invest in those falsely presented as, quote, academic bloomers, end quote. The study concluded, quote, the teachers fostered the intellectual development of the bloomers, producing a self-fulfilling prophecy in which the students who were basically Expect, expected to bloom actually outperformed their peers. In the context of the comic, we applied labeling to situate them as real life superheroes, uh, grounding them in reality as opposed to just a fantastical world. We gave them agency to be that real life superhero through an art exercise, which could be posted and shared uh, with their parents, through their parents and providing them ways to be a real life superhero in their community. Ideas, purpose, content to educate kids about bullying and strategies to deal with it. Features stories of real people. Um, Khadija is based on a very good friend of mine, Nuha, and Gary is a real person. Um, racism and prejudice is kind of where it is an intersection with bullying, if you will, when it comes to racialized students. And we included or rather featured a real life incident of Islamophobia that happened to Nuha um, while riding the uh, subway at Yorkville Station. 
use diverse representation and characters to create the idea that, you know, these are collective issues and we are working together with the same goals in mind. Approach created and, and informed, pardon me, through the lens of children. Children and teenagers were consulted. Why? Because they're the most important stakeholders. And far too often, we project what we think they need as opposed to just asking them and listening. Gary Anuha, whose characters, pardon me, whose characters were based on, uh, who characters were based on, dictated their character's name, attire, and superpower, and also approved the final script. Super, superhero characters, we have Gary, leader of Gary's Global Heroes, based on a real person, uh, pardon me, uh, Gary Goodrich, a former USD superstar, uh, he actually immigrated. So we incorporate facts into the story. So Gary, the person immigrated here from Trinidad, uh, was bullied as a child, usually microaggressions um, related to food and clothes and stuff of that nature. So he got to see things through the lens of someone who was a newcomer being bullied and then became a worldwide mixed martial arts kind of superstar. You have Aharon, a mother, uh, his mother's a Holocaust survivor, faced anti-Semitism and bullying. You have Khadija, again, based on a real person, Nuha. Everything about her matches up with Nuha, basically excluding her name. And Nuha uh, was involved in the creation of the character, as I stated, as well as um, all aspects, really. So Khadija, which is Nuha. Pardon me, I have a cat with a really big attitude who's just throwing stuff on the floor, having a temper tantrum. My apologies, stop that. Her story is featured in the comic, Robin Hood Fights for the Poor and Vulnerable. Real life superhero, that's one of the key themes that we uh, embed within this comic because I can't be Black Panther, I can't be Wonder Woman, I can't be Superman, but there are real life superheroes and we see that every day. We see that with the person who goes to work every day and stands on their feet for 12 hours so we can have food or the driver with Uber. So, um, or, or people delivering food rather and risking their life to make sure we're fed. So real life superheroes are everywhere. And privilege for lack of a better word um, is definitely, uh, it was definitely a privilege to be able to work with Viola Desmond's family, Wanda Robson, her sister, we actually, created two of the first uh, licensed Viola Desmond items where 50% of the money generated goes to a scholarship in her name. So in the comic book, we have um, Viola Desmond page with a uh, original content in the form of a letter from her sister, two kids to inspire them and give them positive feedback, if you will. So again, that's really important. And we wanted to show how everyone can be a real life superhero. Now, delivery mode, we deliver these comics primarily through workshops. Uh, pictures worth a thousand words, so they say. A complex idea can be conveyed with just a single still image, namely making it possible to absorb large amounts of data quickly. The kids are fascinated with the comic. Outcomes, desired outcomes for the comic and workshop, understanding bullying and various forms of prejudice, learn strategies to deal with bullying, encourage working together in allyship. And this is really, really fundamental. See yourself as a real life superhero with agency. Unexpected findings. Discussing sadness and anger in the context of bullying served as an entry point for children to speak to those feelings, resulting in unexpected disclosures, principally these two. I remember a student confided that they were angry because no one listens at home. So this provided um, some information for the teacher to work with and, and perhaps enhance her understanding of, of some other contributing factors. And uh, one student expressed that they were sad because a sibling ran away. And the teacher, classmates, no one in the school was privy to this information. So sometimes the unexpected findings um, can be quite provocative. So with great responsibility, wait, with great power comes great responsibility. So I thank you for the laugh. 
So of course we can't do a workshop and bring, um, create environment for children to feel, feel vulnerable and then leave them be. So what we did is we created a teacher checklist for our anti-bullying workshop. Here's just a, an example, includes the following section. So they can identify and follow up and um, I guess, send it to the proper authority, whether that be the principal or the guidance counselor. So that's very important feedback. We create an overall rating based on a five point scale using a comic to deliver content, innovative and engaging, whether it's appropriate for the students, language used in the materials and workshop was clear and easy to understand and greatest strength visual impact of the comics. So those are just a couple of the metrics. Um, we usually, received very strong feedback. I guess one of the areas that we need to work on moving forward is managing time. It's very hard when you're in a circle and you're sitting down with children and they're sharing their experience, their thoughts and their feelings to rush that process. I'm just not comfortable doing so. So consequently, I have to make up for that time in other spaces. Uh, some of the feedback we received using a comic book really makes an impact in how they see themselves, love the comic book and creating their superheroes because they create their themselves as a superhero in an art exercise, which delivers them a degree of agency because it can be posted and it gives them an opportunity for their voice to be heard. This is from a teacher. My kids all said, quote, this was the best day ever, end quote. No, I did not pay the teacher to say that. Uh, creating their superheroes is something they are still talking about. Reach. Uh, between 2018 and 2021, uh, we delivered the workshops to schools, camps, after school programs, and online. We've reached a total of 600 plus kids have participated in the workshop, and a thousand copies of the comic have been distributed to children, areas in terms of reach, North America. Although we have a lot of our work, uh, a lot of our work is basically focused on TDSB. Because of the pandemic, we pivoted and provided a lot of um, our material online. So we've seen um, a big shift in that. Moving forward, AYS Comics will continue to run workshops through the TDSB. We have pivoted, as I just noted, to online delivery. And we've begun to work on a new comic book, Tackling Hate, with a focus on anti-Semitism. It works. Thanks for listening. Great, thank you so much, Aaron. That was very interesting. All right. All right, and our final presenter for this panel is Tim Chandler. Tim is a writer and art historian who's currently a PH student in art history at Concordia University in Montreal. His research investigates how failure was used as a narrative device in 19th century art writing to communicate avant-gardeness. Prior to Concordia, he worked at the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery as the TD Curator of Education uh, Fellow from 2016 to 2018, and completed his master's in art history and visual culture at the University of Guelph in 2016. Incidentally, I really love the Power Plant. That's a really cool place. In addition to his academic pursuits, Chandler also self-publishes zines and pop culture criticism. His research is supported by a short doctoral fellowship. And uh, today, Tim is going to be presenting, Is Toronto Growing? Community Building and Unconventionality in Comics Festivals. Great, thanks so much, Keith. I'm just gonna share my screen here and start this presentation. Okay. Um, so I, before I begin, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge that I'm giving this presentation, like Keith said, uh, from Montreal, where, where I'm doing my studies, uh, which is located on the unceded lands of the Ganyagahaga people and is uh, historically known as Jajagan. Um, and like Keith said, I'm coming at this from a, an art historical background, and I think uh, at that, a very, very art historical background. Um, so this has kind of informed the way I've uh, kind of started to wade into, you know, the studies of comics, because this is something that, you know, I've never done before, really, but it's something I've always been interested in, because I've always, you know, had an interest in comics. Um, but in, in art history, one of the contemporary topics 
uh, that you know is going around can, right now is that of biennials and biennial culture. So uh, biennials are now the preeminent way of presenting, exhibiting, and consuming contemporary art. Uh, and this has given rise to critics and art historians critiquing them as a form. Uh, so I promise this will be my very short spiel on you know, art history, contemporary art, and then we'll move on to comics. We'll get there eventually. Um, so here we have a definition. Uh, Claude Lausanne described biennials in 2011 as a recurring international exhibition hosted by cities often in order to boost international profile and organized by guest curators around specific themes. So the important takeaway here is that it's a temporary exhibition that is, you know, it touches down in a city uh, for, you know, uh, whatever, two months or whatever delineated amount of time, and then it moves on. And it's often done to you know, establish that city as an art center and an, an important place in, in the art world. So uh, what I thought of is that in the world of comic books and graphic novels, the equivalent of biennials would be comic conventions, which are also large scale public events that serve to showcase a wide variety of artists and personalities. So here we have on the left, you know, a shot of the Venice Biennial, of the big crowd, and on the right, uh, an overhead shot of Fan Expo in Toronto. So both conventions and biennials have a focus on the overall event being a spectacle that will attract the general public. Both biennials and conventions are now so entrenched that their appeal lies more in seeing the spectacle of the entire exhibition rather than any particular work itself, or at least that's what I would argue. Both biennials and conventions have a marquee, uh, you know, like quote unquote original version of the event with uh, biennial equivalent being the Venice Biennial uh, that happens like the name suggests every two years and San Diego Comic-Con being the equivalent for conventions or since this is a Canadian comics conference, we can say Fan Expo. Um, so both have kind of grown to a point now that they're very large money-making entities and they have been subsumed by Western capitalist ideology. And I argue that this is now primarily what they exhibit. This tendency is still growing in events, but there are also smaller communities that are working on a local scale to counteract this trend and build communities and support networks around artists. Uh, so this paper in particular will examine the Toronto Comic Arts Festival. Uh, it's mostly known as TCAF, the abbreviation, and I'll, I'll probably use that name mostly for the rest of this presentation. Uh, as one example of communities pushing back. And here we have a shot of the, you know, the crowd at TCAF. We can look to see TCAF as an example of how others in similar positions have dealt with marquee events being dominated by this capitalist ideology. And in this case, we'll look at TCAF has pushed back against that and, you know, in general pushed back against larger comic conventions and how they compete with them through their programming and also through featuring autobiographical comics and how that helps. So here we have four uh, posters of TCAF that have been used in the past. Uh, the name Toronto Comic Arts Festival was consciously chosen to position the event in opposition to the more traditional and popular convention style events in the comics world. Like the term biennial in the art world, uh, comic convention is a nebulous, albeit loaded term that does not have a standardized definition, but you know, we can, I think all of us can agree that we can generally understand them to be a, a large event at which fans of comics and comic related media congregate to experience the various parts of the subculture. While this may have originally entailed mainly browsing a market, meeting authors and artists, it is now greatly expanded to focus on the vast amount of television and film built around the intellectual property of comics. And often they now feature actors, YouTube personalities, other types of celebrities that are only tangentially tied to the medium. Conventions are now as much about taking in the spectacle of the entire event as they are about celebrating any sort of art. So in this case, we can understand conventions as spectacles in Guy Debord's sense of the word, and that they are a reflection of our social systems, conditions and goals, because they prioritize consumption and consumerism above all else. The style of comic convention 
is a global trend and large cities typically have their own version of it. Like I mentioned, Toronto's is called Farm, uh, Fan Expo, which is the third largest in North America, uh, largest in Canada. And it usually draws around like 130,000 people per year. So they were originally established as a comic convention, Fan Expo was, to showcase comic books and comic, comic book creators. But it's since expanded to include exhibitors from other types of media, such as video games, science fiction, horror films, and they've shifted the focus from comic books and graphic novels to a general interest in, in fandom. So here we have a description from Fan Expo's website, and you can see it says, everyone is a fan of something, and Fan Expo Canada is a great place to celebrate all things pop culture. Get an autograph or a photo with your favorite guest, get the inside scoop on your favorite movies and TV shows with celebrity panels. We can see that they're, even in how they self-identify, we can see they're centering the idea of movies and TV shows taking precedence over comics. Uh, but the TCAF pushes back against these tendencies in a variety of ways. Uh, they distinguish themselves from convention culture by consciously differencing themselves from conventions as an entity and publicly making that part of the festival's identity. Part of this push is naming themselves a festival uh, in order to not be pigeonholed as a convention. And also by firmly making artists and uh, the, the artist's artwork the emphasis of their festival. TCAF's uh, former artistic director, Christopher Butcher, explained the differences between these two types of events in saying, conventions are places where people convene, festivals are places where people celebrate things. By contrast, uh, TCAF's description on its website begins with an acknowledgement that their festival takes place on unceded Indigenous lands, and then describes the event as a week of comic related events, including readings, presentations, panel discussions, gallery shows, and large exhibition area featuring publish, publishers and comic authors and artists. We like to describe it as unconventional. So not only are they centering uh, artists and their artwork as the main thing they're concerned with, but also they're saying we're unconventional, you know, like we're not like your, your regular comic convention. That TCAF is resisting this move towards, you know, quote unquote, conventionality that seems to occur with other large events indicates that they're also resisting the move towards consumerism that most comic centric events inevitably make, at least as much as something that involves a large amount of sales like TCAF can resist it. This is because TCAF repeatedly states that they value artists, creators, and their work above all else and want to keep that at the center of their show. This desire is mirrored in the world of contemporary art today, as many artist run centers and smaller galleries also use an artist first approach to distinguish themselves from the corporate side of the art world. So initially the festival did not allow publishers to exhibit, uh, ensuring that artists and would take first priority in sales and they eventually only changed this policy once the festival had grown significantly in size. Despite comic books and graphic novel publishers now being able to exhibit at TCAF, uh, the focus of the festival is still undeniably on artists who are at the forefront of promotional materials and make up all of the festival's programming. So what I've included here is this was a screenshot of the online edition of TCAF this year that they did uh, through their website and also through uh, discussions that they hosted on YouTube. Uh, this, so this was the landing page for their website, and it was entirely designed by uh, comic book artist Cole Pauls from Vancouver. He was briefly mentioned in one of the other talks earlier today. Uh, and so, I mean, if you're familiar with Cole Pauls' work, it looks exactly like his comic books. So as soon as you go to the TCAF website, you're just presented with, like, TCAF is the Cole Pauls experience. Um, Additional steps to help artists like having a currency exchange present at the festival for international exhibitors and having an artist specific networking workshop events also distinguish TCAF from their peers and competition. Um, the bulk of TCAF's programming is made up of informal panel discussions featuring artists who are exhibiting at the festival, uh, especially ones with newer upcoming work. Like here you can see a screenshot from a panel featuring Georgia Weber and Hartley Lynn, who are at the time promoting new comic books. Uh, in addition to giving artists the chance to promote themselves and their work, these programs also provide direct access to creators for, their, for the audience attending the festival in a way that is not available at larger conventions. There are no barriers preventing guests from asking questions or speaking with artists, especially since TCAF is free to attend, whereas weekend passes for other conventions, such as Fan Expo, 
often start at a cost of upwards of $100 and other VIP packages, like the ones that you would need to meet an artist are even more expensive. I can speak from experience. You can like go up to the authors and talk to them about their work. You can ask them what's going on, what they're working on, stuff like that. It's really interesting. These programming efforts are part of a larger effort to build and engage community around their featured artwork. They endeavor to include other ways to keep artists engaged with the festival and build a supportive community around the artwork, such as professional development and networking opportunities, uh, connecting comic artists with networks of librarians and educators so that they can find new ways to distribute their work. And this makes the hierarchy of the festival more horizontal as panels, and programs allow for lesser known creators to reach more people and find non-sales related benefits from attending the festival. That way, the bigger names and attractions of TCAF do not siphon all the attention away from the rest of the artists at the festival and it becomes a lot easier to discover new work. You can go, if you like stroll to any sort of panel, it's like all but guaranteed you'll find a new comic book creator you've never heard of before, but you're very interested in. So, of course, it's also important to foster connection, not just between artists or audiences, but also between readers and the work featured. And one of the principal ways that TCAP builds community around itself is through highlighting the medium of autobiographical comics and graphic novels, which has been at the center of underground or alternative comics, whichever you prefer, uh, since the 1960s. So here, back at the Cole Paul slide, you can see that on the table spread, uh, there is one section called nonfiction, and if you clicked on that at the online edition of TCAF, it would take you to all the nonfiction and autobiographical comics that were featured at the at the festival that year. Um, this uh, this you know, they're kind of a counterpoint to I guess like mainstream whatever you want to call it comics, uh, and this this dynamic still exists today, albeit on a larger scale because. Uh, superhero comics and the extensive media libraries they've inspired are still for sure the king in the comics economy, without a doubt. But also alternative comics have grown along with them, so much so that, you know, now a festival as big as TCAF can be centered around these sort of like alternative comics. Autobiographical stories allow readers to form more meaningful bonds with the characters because they relate to the experiences of the author. And since the text is telling the story of a person in that person's own words, uh, the reader understands it to be a more authentic story in a kind of way. So when, and these are just, uh, these are three autobiographical comics that were all uh, published last year in 2020 and were featured at TCAF. Uh, when we read autobiographies, we attribute to them a certain degree of, of authority since the person who experienced the events firsthand is the author. Um, in terms of autobiography, uh, Philip Lejeune, who we can see his book, the cover of his book on the on the left here, um, is a noted expert on autobiography, and he describes this as the autobiographical pact between author and reader. Uh, so the former promises the latter to give a detailed account of their life and nothing but that life. This pact is a subconscious one between the reader and the text because we do not know the author personally, in most cases at least, and cannot vouch for their authority. So in agreeing to the autobiographical pact, as Lejeune describes it, we attribute absolute authority and authenticity to the author writing their life. Or if we were to you know, take a page from Fox Mulder, we want to believe the author because they're writing their autobiography. Um, in an autobiographical comic, the author tells us about uh, often a significant change in their life and guides us through their engagement with that time in their life by constantly redrawing episodes from it. By reading through this change visually, the reader can easily associate themselves with the identity of the author, thereby engaging with their own identity at the same time. TCAF makes a significant effort to exhibit a diverse range of artists so that they reflect the diversity of the city they're based in. One of the main draws for this diverse population is that they can see their own identities reflected in the work being exhibited at the festival through autobiographical comics. Uh, for example, if a young queer person attends the festival and buys an autobiographical comic from a queer author, they are able to engage with their own queer identity by reading a story of transformation of another person. Uh, there's a great essay by Elizabeth L. Refaye, uh, who writes about this particular example, uh, or writes about this phenomenon with her example being Alison Bechdahl's memoir, Fun Home, which I have a, an excerpt of here on the, on the slide. 
So by being drawn in by the transformation metaphor, uh, such as the one used by Bechdel in her memoir, they are being led on a guided engagement with themselves and seeing their own experiences being embodied in a secondhand way. In terms of a larger context, TCAF's efforts to push back against the hegemony of larger, more corporate events with their own sphere of production and succeed in spite of them is part of a longer history of this being done in Toronto. Since the city is a major hub in the network of Canada's economy, smaller and subversive forms of art are dwarfed by conservative attitudes that accompany corporate business. Uh, so there's, uh, there's a book by a Canadian art historian, Philip Monk, that looks at uh, this like similar type of phenomenon happening in Toronto contemporary art in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s as the contemporary, well, I guess not current contemporary, but as conceptual art really started to blossom in Toronto and there was a strong like community around it. Um, and at that time though, excuse me, though spaces and federal funding for artists were scarce, and those that existed were often shut down or turned into more financially driven developments, the community found a way to persevere for a short time, which paid dividends in the decades to come, as this community is still very influential today. I think all of this speaks to sort of a Janus nature in Toronto that the city is still struggling to reconcile. One part of the city's cultural identity is still looking to the past, and is limited by the conservative and Protestant ideals that so strongly influenced it during its development in the early 20th century. And this past is more now more visible than ever with the Toronto government of Rob Ford from 2010 to 2014 and the Ontario government of Doug Ford from 2018 to the present marking a return to conservative politics in the city and its present and its province and cutting the arts funding in both cases. Uh, whereas Toronto Comic Arts Festival depends on granting organizations such as the Toronto Arts Council, Ontario Arts Council, and Canada Council for the Arts, all of which uh, suffered funding under uh, Doug Ford. Uh, events like Fan Expo can still thrive because the revenue is generated from private sales and in general are a little bit more like capitalist in their goals. Conventions and biennials prove that the line between artwork and commodity is thin and can be easily broken, but the Toronto Comic Arts Festival proves that it can be maintained through conscious perseverance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. All right, and thank you everyone for three fantastic papers. So we, we still have a lot of time uh, remaining for discussion um, and uh, I, I do really want to open it up because I feel like just based on um, you know, the, the way the chat was going throughout the panel, I feel like people have a lot of uh, questions to ask. Um, yeah, Anna, you have a, a question for Tim. Uh, would you like to get us started? Sure. Uh, thanks, Keith. And thanks, everyone, for such wonderful presentations. Um, great stuff. Um, I wanted to ask you, Tim, in terms of talking about the inclusiveness of TCAF, one of the things that's always struck me about that was how, despite that message of inclusiveness, it's existed in kind of an adversarial relationship with other segments of comics, fandom, and culture, particularly superhero fandom. Um, until recently, and I did just check during your presentation, but I know it was up as recently as a few months ago, they had like a advice about attending TCAP and obviously they've changed it since it's online. And I remember because this has been on the site for years, they had advice for attendees that it's a cosplay free zone and that they don't allow people to cosplay. And that just has struck me always as such like a strange, they're trying to promote inclusivity by saying certain behaviors are allowed and not allowed and certain ways of being a fan are allowed and not allowed. And I just wondered if you had any kind of thoughts about that, like how do you prevent it from becoming sort of an embattled space where sort of certain types of fandom are allowed and certain types of fandom aren't allowed and certain types of comics count as serious and other comics don't count as serious and I'm just sort of interested in some of the questions around the way TCAP has presented themselves mm -hmm. sort of over the years. I did make the mistake of semi-cosplaying at TCAP one year and <laughs> it was not welcomed <laughs> and that made me feel very alienated in that space sure, because yeah. you know I'm someone that reads comics from sort of I study superheroes, but I'm in those other spaces as well as a comic scholar. And yeah, I'm just interested in any thoughts that you might have about that. Like how do we create an inclusive space without sort of replicating some of those hierarchies, but still sort of 
because obviously we all get like making the case for comics being serious sometimes means denigrating other genres, but how do we sure. sort of make a space that's not doing that? If that quite makes sense as a question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for your question. And I think that's an interesting, uh, a really interesting question to unpack too, because uh, I think for sure their decision to uh, exclude cosplaying plays into their idea of being unconventional, right? Like they're seeing, okay, cosplaying is such a huge part of uh, like a mainstream con culture and they, and I guess in their mind, see it as a way to, okay, so this is one way we can exclude a certain type of fan from coming to the festival, which as you've pointed out, can be very exclusionary to some people. I guess in their mind, they see it as a way that it, maybe it's a net good for them. I'm not sure. I can't speak for on behalf of the creators of TCAP whatsoever. Um, but I think you have to do have a very valid point in terms of it's, it's still exclusion in terms of maybe in their mind, it's a good exclusion in terms of cutting out a certain type of of fan coming to the festival and maybe I didn't mind taking up space at the festival or turning it into something they don't want to do. But at the same time, that does have a very real consequence as well. Um, I also thought your your point too about like deciding what type of comics are serious is a very, uh, very valid one as well, right? Where it's um, focusing on more independently published comics. Uh, certainly it does, serve to prop up a lot of creators and a lot of artists. But at the same time, uh, I mean, I can speak for myself. I don't necessarily read a lot of superhero comics now, but I, for sure my gateway into reading comics was reading X-Men as you know uh, a younger child as well. So, I mean, would I be interested in you know darker independent comics now if I hadn't read X-Men as a child? Would I have enjoyed to going to TCAF as you know uh, a 10 year old who loved Wolverine because he was Canadian versus being a more jaded 30 year old now. It's, it's hard to say. Hey, Jasleen, you have a question for Aaron? <clears throat> um, yes, um, Aaron, thanks. I thought that was very interesting to listen about your um, project. Um, so if you don't mind, um, I'll contact you um, later um, uh, about it. But I'll, I'll just quickly ask her something. Um, uh, could you just explain more about your evaluation pro pro um, process and um, what other sorts of metrics you use? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm losing my voice, forgive me. Is this uh, with respect to the workshop? Um, yes, the, the um, yes, that's right, yeah, exactly. No worries, if, if I may, let me just, um, well, actually, no, let's not do that. I was going to try and revert back to uh, my PowerPoint notes, but we know how that worked out um, last time. So in terms of our evaluation, what we did is we did it through a committee. So we had Donna Hero, who's the creator of the Afrocentric School. We had three to four uh, stakeholders on a professional level. And then we had about five students and teenagers. And collectively, what we did is we put together that kind of metric and we were looking um, all right, let me, let me see if I can. Yeah, no, I'm not going to play that. Um, so we have basically a page and a half that covers, um, in terms of the response to the comics, the different, um, exercises that we have within that hour. So we really try and evaluate it. And we asked TDSB for their input because that seemed rather prudent. So we try and evaluate it in terms of time management in terms of messaging, in terms of the interactive component, in terms of lasting effect. So sometimes uh, we have a lot of repeat business so we can assess the impact and the residual impact, uh, the residual effect on the child. So that's a little long winded, but we did it in consultation with key stakeholders. And as I mentioned earlier, I always look at young people as a part of those key stakeholders. And then we continue to evolve and change it and modify it. And what we also did is we have a section for comments. Otherwise, it's almost a lesson in, in futility because you can set it up and design it in such a way that you could um, create the responses that you want. So I think it's imperative from an ethical point of view to uh, allow them to make uh, additional comments uh, in a very open-ended way so that we can continue to learn and grow from their feedback. So I think that was under five minutes, but that's what I got for you. Okay, great. Thanks. That was over three years, wasn't it? <laughs>
Thank you for the question. I appreciate it. And I look forward to speaking. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Neil, you have a question for Maxwell? Oh, hi. Thank you so much for the presentation, Max. That was really thought provoking and really interesting. Um, while you were speaking uh, about transcripts, it made me think about, um, I don't use transcripts myself, but I do make heavy use of something very similar, which is descriptive bibliography. Uh, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how this might relate uh, this, this issue of the kind of inescapable interpret interpretive element uh, that we sort of can't ever avoid. Um, to me, descriptive bibliography is a way for me to have or try to reconstruct a sensory experience that I'm otherwise unable to have about the touch or the sight or even the smell of a certain object that I can't have access to either because of time or geographical location. I, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about just the consequence of what you've, I, I think, really well observed and well articulated about this kind of thick description of something. Thanks so much. And uh, I've, I've also been, uh, I've, I've been, um, I've, I've just had a chance to, to go through the, to go through the chat, the, uh, um, the, uh, the screen reading robot machine doesn't auto read the chat, but I've, I've had a chance to go through there and, uh, and uh, thank you so much to, uh, to those, to those in chat. Um, this is really cool. Thanks, Neil. And I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it before. Um, at, at all the the similarity here, um, I I guess I guess how I guess how I would relate it is um, is that the um, I guess the the way I would relate it is is uh, to if if I'm understanding descriptive descriptive bibliography correctly um, is that the transcripts provide us both a the do, doing multiple transcripts have has provided me this kind of simultaneously secure so the, the bit, bit of security in terms of a sense that i have i have gotten i really have gotten a a clear understanding from multiple angles of what's going on on the of what's going on in this sequence, and that, um, and and that the the fundamentals of that I talk about the I talk about the differences a lot, but that the fundamentals of that do remain the same, and that that um, and that therefore several people who wrote um, who who wrote descriptions of this thing um, of this sequence of images. Did come up with something that is it in broad that in broad strokes evokes a similar response in me, and that therefore, um, and and that therefore text can evoke that response in a way that's effective. So on the one hand, kind of a reassurance that this sort of description can can recall to us or fashion for us something that might be to some degree consistent, and on the other hand, a sense of profound contingency in that. Um, in, in that, you know, the the different the different descriptions, the different transcriptions, um, are are coming are coming up with something that is in some of the is in some of the bits and pieces that that together build the the together build the overall closure uh, are coming up with things that are that are a bit different from one another, and in some cases some some kind of load bearing ways. Um, dependent perhaps on the uh, on you know the, the the conditions under which they were created, like the um, the the accessibility services team that put, that was very wonderful and put these comics transcriptions um, together. Uh, they had they have gallons and gallons of alternate format work to do for all kinds of students across the university. They had thousands of pages of, they had probably a thousand pages of comics to do for me, for the class that I was in. And so like they can, they can only take so much time under those conditions of possibility. Whereas one of the other transcripts, um, the, the person, the, the, the writer took an hour um, to, to do the two pages. Um, so, 
that's a that's a long way of saying something that I'm I'm not I hope I hope kind of answers your question that it I I wonder if the if the if the place where descriptive bibliography and these kinds of transcriptions meet is is simultaneously in a sense of reassurance that it is possible to to use text to capture um, to capture something of the visual. And on the other hand, a, re a reminder to us that there's this profound contingency that comes along with where we were at or where where the writer was at when they were doing that describing. Well, thank you so much. I, I really like the idea of security and contingency kind of equally being balanced. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks for asking. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, we are running a little bit over time, um, but it is the end of the day. Did anyone have any final burning questions that they wanted to ask? I have like three, but I'm just going to save them for the Discord because we don't. I don't want to take advantage of my uh, authority here. All right. Um, one thing. Uh, yeah, I I feel like I've got like a lot of questions as well as like a lot of. I just want to um recommend people talk to each other because i just see a lot of connections between some of the research that you're doing and research that i've seen from other other members in the society so i'll probably be posting links to that stuff in the in the discord uh, i'm going to post the link to the discord one more time because we are at the end of today's session and uh, i i do want to encourage everyone to keep having these discussions there but um if there aren't any other uh questions and i think i will bring today's panel to an end and ask you all to please thank our wonderful presenters for their contributions and and sharing their research with us today because it was really excellent and um thank you everyone for for joining us for the first day of the conference uh tomorrow we are going to have a, a really great round table on publishing in canadian comic studies um, we also have our uh, AGM and our final creator talk, where I'll be talking with Evan Narcissus from uh, uh, who's, who's worked with a number of Marvel uh, characters in the past. So uh, please come back and join us tomorrow for those discussions. But again, thank you to our three presenters today. This was a really excellent uh, panel to, to end on. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Great.